are when you have a face to look at. Um, and I especially encourage the students who are taking this class to keep their videos on. Um, so Kelsey, if you are ready, I will go ahead and introduce you. I'm ready. All right, let's go. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelsey Kaufman today. Um, I met Kelsey at a Society of Invertebrate Pathology meeting um, during the social hour, and then I later attended her talk on, which is a very similar topic, on um, symbiont, symbiont, um, sorry, symbiont viruses of uh, parasitoids, which I didn't even know existed, and I was just so fascinated by the topic, I immediately went up to her and said, you need to come and give a seminar. Um, and so Kelsey did her uh, master's at University of Missouri and then went on to do her PhD at University of Georgia. Uh, then she got the, no <laughs> <laughs> the pleasure of going and working um, through a USDA postdoctoral fellowship, worked at the university, uh, sorry, not university, at USDA in Hilo, Hawaii, um, with a colleague of mine from grad school. So that was kind of a fun connection. Um, and now is a brand new assistant professor at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where it sounds like she's going to be continuing some of her research on these um, facultative symbionts of uh, parasitoid wasps. So um, Kelsey, give it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anne, for the introduction. And thanks to everyone tuning in today. I'm very excited to share with all of you some of my work looking at these mutualistic viruses found in parasitoid wasps. And then at the very end, I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit of the prospects I think they could have for future biocontrol. So I probably don't need to tell this crowd about parasitoid wasps, but just to highlight for my talk um, that this is a lethal interaction that they have with their hosts. Meaning once this wasp here lays her egg into this caterpillar, only one of the two insects will ultimately survive. Either the caterpillar will mount an effective immune response that kills that invading wasp egg, or that developing wasp will evade those host defenses and eventually kill the caterpillar. So this has led to co-evolution between parasitoids and their hosts, in which each is adapting to outdo the other. Arguably one of the cooler adaptations that parasitoids have repeatedly evolved are these um, heritable associations with beneficial viruses in which virus particles are produced in the reproductive organs of female wasps and then get injected into the host insect during oviposition. Then inside of the host, the virus will infect host cells and manipulate host physiology in ways that benefit that developing wasp. So this can be things like suppressing the host immune system as well as altering host development. Therefore, this can be seen as a mutualistic association because the wasp benefits from the activity of that virus while developing inside the host, and the virus benefits from the replication and transmission supplied by the wasp. So most parasitoid viruses that we know about um, are produced in the ovaries of female wasps. So the ovaries pictured here are from that wasp I just showed you, Micropletus demolitor. And specifically, the virus is produced in this bulbous bluish region at the end of the ovaries called the calyx region. And if you were to dissect out these ovaries in a normal light microscope, they actually have this blue iridescence sort of in that calyx region uh, as an artifact of just how densely packed virus particles are stored within it. And so as mature eggs leave the ovaries uh, during oviposition, they get coated in virus particles on their way into the host insect. So most parasitoid viruses that we know about exist as endogenous viral elements or EVEs, meaning that the viral genome has permanently integrated within the wasp genome. So shown here is a portion of the Micropletus genome and highlighted in red are a couple of these viral gene clusters. And I should note that rather than the virus integrating as one large chunk of DNA, what we see rather is a scattering of these viral genes across the wasp genome. So as I mentioned, parasitoids have repeatedly evolved these types of heritable associations with viruses, shown on this parasitoid phylogeny here with different virus particles, indicate several of the independent virus acquisition events that we currently know of. My work to date has largely focused on this group of parasitoids down here called the opiini. They primarily attack to fruited fruit flies as hosts, and they contain their own unique viruses, although they are relatively understudied. And so my long-term goal is really to gain a more comprehensive understanding of beneficial virus evolution 
by trying to characterize these systems that we know exist, but have received very little functional or genetic characterization to date. So first, I will mention this wasp here, Phopius aerosanus. This is an opiine wasp that lays its eggs into tiferted fruit fly eggs, so it's an egg parasitoid. And this wasp was not known to produce a virus until relatively recently when its genome was sequenced. And within the Phopius genome was found several clusters of viral genes shown here again in red. And so this picture looks pretty similar to those other viruses in the sense that you have these uh, scattered integrations of viral genes across the wasp genome. But you know, just the presence of these viral genes doesn't necessarily indicate that virus particles are being produced by these wasps. And so the next thing was to dissect out the ovaries of female Phopius wasps. And now we're seeing another similar picture, which is this bulbous bluish calyx region at the end of the ovaries, further suggesting that virus particles might be produced here. Further microscopy of that calyx region showed just that. We've got this dense array of these virus particles. Um, and proteomics analysis did indicate that it's the viral genes in the wasp genome that are producing these virus particles. So this was identified as an endogenous nudie virus and represents an independent example of this phenomenon. Much more recently, I've started trying to understand what the function of this virus might be for Phopius wasps or what it might be doing within the fruit fly hosts of the wasp. Uh, but my first sort of aim was to generate wasps that were removed of their viral population. And my main method of doing this was to utilize uh, RNA interference technology, uh, basically to try to knock down the expression of four different viral genes at the same time. And so I did this by creating a double-stranded RNA cocktail that targets those four genes and then injecting that cocktail into female wasps at the early pupil stage and then waiting till they emerge as adults to see if that viral gene expression had been affected. So here are what the expression of those four genes looked like upon adulthood. Um, in each case, uh, compared to the control level of expression of these genes, which is on the left side of each graph, we do see an effective knockdown in each case, um, telling us that RNAi is a successful tool to disrupt viral gene expression in this species. And here's a photo of ovaries from both treatments. So on the left, we have a pair of control ovaries. They've got that bulbous calyx region that has that blue iridescence. But then on the right, we have a pair of our knockdown ovaries. And you can see that calyx region is relatively clear, I would say. But there seems to be something funky also going on there, um, which would um, need further study. But anyway, these wasps are likely virus depleted. So it's still too early to say what the function of this virus might be for Phopius wasps. But now that we have wasps that have the virus and those that don't have the virus, we can start to untangle this by doing comparative experiments to see if there's an impact when wasps don't have the virus with them. And we're already seeing several features of convergent evolution between this system and other parasitoid viruses, such as that integrated and dispersed viral genome within the wasp genome, as well as the ovaries as a site of virus particle production. And just this repeated observation of this endogenous viral genome architecture that we see amongst all these systems strongly suggests that it is important for the formation and persistence of these uh, relationships. My one caveat is that most identified Eves and parasitoids that have a known viral ancestor are all derived from the same virus family, those nudie viruses. And so it begs the question, do all parasitoid viruses share these same features because of their importance for maintaining these relationships? Or is it rather a product of the same type of virus getting repeatedly acquired by parasitoid lineages and therefore evolving in similar ways? So that brings me to another parasitoid virus system um, in this wasp here, Diachasma morpha longicodata, or d longi for short. And my work to date on this system has really had the overarching goal of characterizing a divergent viral association. So this is another opiine wasp. Um, it lays its eggs into tiferted fruit fly larvae. Um, in my PhD lab, we reared our d longi on this fly here, the Caribbean fruit fly, Anastrepha suspensa. And in this system, the virus is not produced in wasp ovaries, but rather in the venom glands of female wasps. Venom gland is um, in, responsible for producing venomous proteins that get injected with wasp eggs. Um, so it's closely associated with the reproductive system. 
And you'll notice it's the venom gland in this case that has a bright blue iridescence if you dissect them out under the microscope, indicating how much virus is stored within it. This virus is a pox virus known as DLEPV for short. And pox viruses are very different in their basic biology than the ancestors of these other parasitoid viruses. So very different than nudie virus biology, making this an ideal system to investigate. So the first project I want to share with you today was looking at the function of this virus from a very basic standpoint in both the wasps as well as their fruit fly hosts. So the first question I asked is whether this virus is pathogenic to the flies. We know that the virus is transferred from the wasp to the fly when she lays her egg, and we also know that the virus can replicate within the fly hosts. Does that mean that it's ultimately um, pathogenic to the fly? And to answer this question, I purified virus from the venom glands of female wasps and then injected that into fly larvae at these three different doses. First being a physiological dose, which is the amount a wasp would normally inject during oviposition, followed by two different serial dilutions of that physiological dose. And then as a negative control, I injected separate flies with virus that had been UV inactivated at the same three doses. And first I simply measured whether flies could survive this viral infection. So each pie chart here indicates the proportion of flies that emerged as adults after being injected with the virus's larvae. And this top row here is our inactive virus treatment, where as we expect, the grand majority of flies survived the viral injection. But if we look at the bottom row, the active virus treated flies, we get no survival um, of flies given the first two doses, and only about 2% survived that very lowest dose of the virus. And here are images of those flies at 12 days post-injection. So up top is our inactive virus treated flies uh, that more so look like adults at this point, they should be about to emerge in a matter of days. And so they've got well-formed eyes, dense CD on their backs and darkened wing coloration. However, with our active virus treated flies, they just haven't quite made it there yet. It seems that their development has stalled somewhere during the pupil stage and these flies will never emerge as adults. So we definitely know that this virus is pathogenic to the flies, but that doesn't necessarily indicate that it's beneficial for the wasps. And so to understand whether this is truly a mutualistic virus for the parasitoids, I again explored ways of removing that viral population from the wasps to assess its function. And so again, I turned to RNA interference. Um, this time I made a cocktail targeting three different uh, DLEPV genes uh, to knock them down simultaneously. I injected that cocktail into the wasps at that early pupil stage and then measured expression when they uh, emerged as adults. And again here, with the three viral genes that we targeted, we almost see a complete knockdown in each case um, compared to that control level of expression. So again, RNAi is a valid tool to use in this species as well. Here are images of the venom glands from both treatments. So up top is a control venom gland. It's got that bright blue iridescence that we expect from the virus. But then at bottom with our viral knockdown venom gland, you can see these tubules are relatively empty. In this system, I've been able to take a step further and actually measure the parasitism success of wasps when they have that virus compared to when they don't. And so overall, when they have the virus, wasp survival is at relatively good proportions. But as soon as you remove that virus, uh, that survival rate plummets, indicating that this is a very beneficial virus for the wasps to have. Although you will notice that some uh, wasps can survive without the virus, just at very low frequencies, indicating that while this virus is very beneficial, it is in a sense facultative rather than obligate for the wasps. So in summary, we now know that DLEPV is very virulent to the flies because if you inject them with virus, pretty much all of them die. And that's correlated with some type of arrested development. And then secondly, we now know DLEPV is very beneficial for the wasps because if you remove the virus from the wasps, their survival rate is drastically reduced. And so this data tells us that functionally, DLEPV displays convergent evolution with other parasitoid viruses, because just like those parasitoid eaves, we're seeing some type of physiological manipulation caused by the virus inside of the host insect. And then also like parasitoid eaves, this virus is very beneficial for the wasps to be infected with. 
So as a counterpart to that functional characterization of the virus, I next moved into a project in which I sequenced the viral genome and compared it to pox virus relatives, as well as these other parasitoid virus genomes to further understand its evolution. So here's the DLEPV genome sequence. It is a large double-stranded DNA virus. And what you'll notice right away is that it is assembled into one big contiguous piece that is not flanked by any WASP genes. And so we really don't think that this genome has integrated within the WASP genome. And we have other data to support that as well. And that's highly unusual given what all of these other systems seem to say, which is that the integrated nature is sort of pivotal. Um, and I next annotated this genome and pretty much found all of the pox virus genes we would expect to find in a pox virus. And the sort of uh, architecture of the genome as a whole is still pretty similar to other pox viruses. Um, and so we really don't think that this virus is integrated and, and sort of very surprising the level of genomic preservation that we're seeing with this virus compared to all other parasitoid viruses that we know about. Next, I built this phylogeny to get a better understanding of where this virus may have originated from. So on this tree, we have some insect pox viruses up top. We've got some vertebrate pox viruses down below. And what we found is a strongly supported recent common ancestor between DLEPV and this Yalta virus. And Yalta virus is a recently discovered pox virus within Drosophila melanogaster. And so these data suggest then that DLEPV may have originated as a fly pathogen, which would make sense given the fruit fly hosts of its associated parasitoid. But just getting back to this question of how does an exogenous virus or an unintegrated virus maintain its symbiotic relationship with the wasp? Because much of what we understand about these uh, parasitoid Eve systems is really wrapped up in that integrated nature of the viral genome, as it suggests that the wasp is sort of able to tightly control where and when those viruses are produced. Um, but in this case, we don't have that integrated nature. And so we looked into this question next. And so we do have quantitative PCR data showing that this virus can replicate in both female wasps. So right at this transition from pupa to adult, we see a big jump in viral abundance in the females. Um, but we also know that it can rapidly replicate within the fruit fly uh, during parasitism. However, we only see those virulent effects of the virus when it's replicating in the fly. Um, we don't really see any disease caused by this virus within the, the wasps. And so that led us to ask, how does DLEPV achieve this sort of selective virulence within wasps and fly hosts? Um, and our hypothesis is that there's still some sort of control happening from the side of the wasp in which replication of that virus is being maximized so that she has a lot of virus particles to inject with her eggs. But then the virulence of the virus is minimized so as not to cause harm to the wasp itself. And then we think more so in the fly that it's acting as a normal pathogen in the sense that it can replicate and cause lots of disease. But rather than that physical separation of viral genes within the wasp genome that we think allows for that sort of control in these other systems, here we explored differences in viral gene expression uh, to see whether that's also somewhat the case here as well. So I performed an RNA sequencing experiment in which I first extracted RNA from both parasitoid wasp venom glands, as well as parasitized fly tissues, both at stages of peak virus replication. So that in the fly is when it's in the pupil stage. I then sequenced those RNAs, mapped the viral reads back to the DLEPV genome, and then explored differences in viral gene expression between the two host insects. So here's what the data looked like. Um, this heat map here, each row is a different DLEPV gene. There's about 200 of them, and each column is a different RNA sample. So the six columns on the left are from parasitized fly tissue, and the six on the right are from wasp venom gland tissue. And right away, we find over 90% of our viral genes show significant differential expression between the two insects, telling us that there are major differences in viral activity going on here. And then also, our data kind of nicely cluster into basically two halves where up top here, these are all the viral genes down-regulated within the wasp. And then at bottom is the reverse. These are all the viral genes that are up-regulated when it's replicating in the wasp. And we find some interesting results when we start looking at the genes within these two clusters. 
First being that over 80% of our core viral replication genes are found in this bottom cluster. So replication genes are largely being upregulated in the wasp. And then for the other cluster, we find almost 80% of our putative virulence genes. So virulence genes are largely being downregulated when it's in the wasp. And so this data support our hypothesis that the, these two main functions of a virus, replication and virulence, are sort of being um, differentially segregating between the two insects. And again, we think that's mostly coming from the wasp side of things, in which we think that the wasp is maximizing the viral replication and minimizing the virulence. So the DLEPV genome largely retains the structure of its ancestor. Um, it's still exogenous. It still contains most of the genes pox viruses need, and it can still replicate in both the wasps and the flies. And then that phylogenetic data support that this virus may have originated from a fly pathogen, suggesting that the ancestral function of this virus is also being preserved. And then our transcriptomic data suggests DLEPV exhibits a novel mechanism of what I'm calling functional partitioning. Um, but rather than that physical separation of viral genes um, in these Eve systems that allows for this sort of partitioning. Here we see wide-scale differences in viral gene expression that we think are promoting the stability of the symbiosis. So I think this lack of endogenization for DLEPV seems to have major implications for how it's being maintained. So to wrap up this, these first two projects, I think uh, the pox virus system really highlights how viral ancestry can dictate how these associations evolve and persist, because clearly the story is much bigger than what we know from these parasitoid Eve systems. And secondly, many of these viruses um, have classically been referred to as symbionts, but in reality, we now know that a bunch of them are permanent components of wasp genomes and can't really exist apart from the wasp at this point. And therefore, it's sort of maybe not um, truly a symbiont at this point. And if that's the case, then I think DLEPV then could, is a good candidate for a true viral symbiont because it maintains this exogenous genome while still providing a massive benefit for the wasps that are infected. So moving forward, we can use this newfound classification of DLEPV as a true symbiont to further investigate the dynamics of the system. Because while we might expect certain aspects of the system to resemble other parasitoid viruses, due to that analogous role that it plays during parasitism, we may also expect the system to resemble um, other types of microbial symbionts, such as bacteria, due to its exogenous genome structure. And so next are a few projects in which I'm using this new conceptual framework to further understand uh, the dynamics of the system. And first is a project in which I looked more closely into the ways in which this virus is transmitted among wasps. So initially, I had quantitative PCR data looking at how much virus is in developing wasps, um, which showed that there's a substantial amount of virus found within wasp eggs, suggesting that transmission of this virus is vertical from mom to offspring through a route known as transovarial transmission, basically meaning that mom's packaging virus particles into the eggs before she even lays them. However, there's also this dramatic swell in viral abundance during the larval stage of the wasp as it's feeding on fly tissue. And if we further dissect out these wasps during the larval stage, we find that the grand majority of virus is found within their gut contents, suggesting that as this wasp is feeding on the host from the inside out, um, it's consuming large amounts of virus particles and generally being surrounded by a ton of virus. And that led us to ask whether this virus could be acquired by wasps externally meaning as the wasp is surrounded and ingesting all of this virus, could those virus particles ultimately colonize the venom gland of female offspring? To determine whether that is the case in this system, I utilized our uninfected wasp um, that we uh, generated with RNAi, but at this point we've been able to maintain them as a stable colony of wasps. And my main methods here were to allow those uninfected wasps to lay eggs into the flies, and then reintroduce the virus back into the fly during parasitism and check to see if the female offspring have now reacquired the virus within the venom gland. 
So I first set up an experiment in which I manually reintroduced virus back into the system. And so I first allowed those uninfected wasps to lay eggs. And then I took those fly larvae and I injected them with a physiological dose of virus. Um, and then we waited till any female offspring emerged and screened them to see if they had reacquired it. And I should also mention here that I repeated this experiment using that UV inactivated virus as a negative control. And so now looking at this graph here, this is showing the amount of virus within the venom glands of those female offspring. And so what it says is that if these wasps develop in the presence of inactive virus and they were uninfected to begin with, they largely remain uninfected as adults. However, if uninfected wasps uh, develop in the presence of active virus, they fully reacquired that viral load by adulthood. So there's billions of copies now back into their venom glands indicating that, yes, there does seem to be some sort of external transmission going on here. I then took those wasps and measured their survival now that they have either not reacquired the virus or have. And if these wasps remain uninfected with the viral symbiont, they still perform pretty poorly during parasitism. Although again, we're still seeing small proportions that seem to survive without it. But if these wasps have reacquired the virus, they fully reacquire that beneficial phenotype to their survival within a single generation. I next wanted to see if this sort of mode of transmission uh, is, can occur during a natural scenario in these wasps known as super parasitism. This is when a single host um, has multiple wasp eggs laid within it. And it's feasible that if an infected wasp lays an egg into the same host as an uninfected wasp, that uninfected wasp uh, offspring could reacquire the virus simply by sharing this host not, that is now definitely infected with the virus. So to determine whether that's happening here, I utilize the haplodiploid sex determination system of Hymenoptera. Basically what that means is if a male and female wasp love each other very much, they will mate. And then that female can either lay fertilized eggs that will develop into female offspring, or she can lay unfertilized eggs that develop into males. Um, if a wasp remains unmated, she can still lay eggs, but they will all be unfertilized and therefore all be male offspring. So I set up another experiment in which I first allowed unmated virus infected wasps to lay eggs into the flies. So these wasps are introducing virus into the flies, but they're only laying male eggs. And then I took those same flies and then gave them to mated uninfected wasps. And so these wasps are not introducing virus but they are laying either female or male eggs. And so what we get at the end of this are these super parasitized flies. And we know that any female wasps that ultimately emerge from them will have originated from that uninfected line. So we can then screen them for the virus to see if they have now reacquired it. So I performed seven replicate trials of this experiment. And in each case, 100% of females that were uninfected originally, but developed in, the, in these super parasitism scenarios, uh, reacquired the virus and are now DLEPV positive. I measured how much exactly virus they have within their venom glands. Um, and compared to a normal infected colony wasp, these super parasitism females more or less have the same amount. So several billion copies of the virus. So we now know DLEPV can be acquired by uninfected wasps with perfect efficiency, really, because both manual or natural reintroduction of the virus during parasitism by an uninfected wasp causes a full infection reversal. And that benefit that the virus provides to parasitism success is strongly tied to the infection status of the wasp. If the wasps have the virus, they survive at good proportions. As soon as you take that virus away, their survival plummets. If you give it back to them, it's right back up to normal. And so it tells us that DLEPV displays what we call post-hatch transmission, which is very much not something that these other parasitoid viruses employ. Um, because those viruses are permanent parts of the wasp genome, they are strictly transmitted through the germline. Um, but this is something that's found fairly commonly in other insect symbionts, in which the insect mother will deposit the symbionts near the site of oviposition, and then those insect offspring consume the symbionts after they hatch. And so this is the case for a lot of bacterial symbionts. And this mode of transmission allows for DLEPV to be transmitted both vertically and horizontally among wasps. 
So now we move into a couple of projects that I performed uh, during my postdoc with the ARS in Hilo, Hawaii, so on the big island. And the first of which is a project in which I looked at the potential role of this viral symbiont in shaping the host range of its parasitoid. So this project began from a unique aspect of D. longi ecology, which is that it's a generalist parasitoid species, meaning not only can this wasp successfully develop within the Caribbean fruit fly, but it can also develop within a number of very distantly related fruit fly genera. Because of this generalist behavior, D. longi, along with a number of parasitoids, were released across the Hawaiian islands uh, back in the 1950s to try to suppress pestiferous fruit fly populations that had become established there. And so the three big pest species of fruit flies on Hawaii today are the medfly, Ceratatus capitata, the oriental fruit fly, Bactrocera dorsalis, and the melon fly, Zugodacus cucurbiti. And Delongi, along with Phopius aerosonis wasps, which I mentioned earlier, have actually helped lead to suppression of both medfly and oriental fruit fly populations in Hawaii. However, there's no data suggesting that Delongi uses melon fly as a host. So the first thing I did was to measure the survival rate of Delongi parasitoids when using these three different flies as the host. And what I found is that in both medfly and oriental fruit flies, we get good levels of wasp emergence. However, not a single wasp ever emerged after using the melon fly as a host. And what this tells us is that both medfly and oriental fruit fly are permissive hosts for Delongi, while the melon fly is a non-permissive host, because even though the wasps will lay eggs into melon fly larvae, those eggs never survive to adulthood. Naturally, I was interested in whether DLEPV, the symbiont, is somehow involved in shaping this unique host range pattern. So the next thing I did was to purify virus from wasp venom glands, and then inject that virus at three different doses into each of the three fly species. And again, here I'm measuring the ability of those flies to emerge as adults. Um, and what we find overall is a gradation of susceptibility to DLEPB displayed by these different flies, in which up top here with the med fly is the most susceptible to the virus, in which we see no flies surviving the first two doses, and only about 11% can handle that lowest dose. Next, with the oriental fruit fly, um, again, we get no flies surviving the highest dose, but we do start to see flies surviving the intermediate dose, and then about half can survive that lowest dose. And then at bottom, by far the least susceptible to the virus is the melon fly, where right away at the highest dose, we start getting uh, flies that are able to handle the viral infection. Next, I measured the abundance of the virus over time after injection um, with those three same doses. And what we find here is that those mortality patterns I just showed you are mirrored by the ability of the virus to replicate within the different flies at the different doses. For example, in medfly, in these doses in which we see these really nice replication curves, and also in oriental fruit fly, these doses are correlated um, with those that no fly survived. And also with the melon fly at all three doses we gave it, we see no virus replication over time that's correlated with some proportion of flies always being able to survive the infection. And so this link emerged between the ability of this virus to replicate and cause disease within these different fly species and the ability of the parasitoid to successfully use them as hosts. Next, I performed a large-scale transcriptome experiment, first looking at viral gene expression during the first 24 hours of infection. And so this heat map here, again, each row is a different viral gene and um, each of the different color codes are for the different fly species. And the big takeaway here is that there's this large die-off of viral gene expression that we see in the melon fly that we don't really see in the other two fly species. And if we look at how these genes were clustered, more or less, the clustering here is between uh, early viral genes and late viral genes. So early viral genes are those expressed very quickly after the uh, infection begins, and then late viral genes happen later on in the replication cycle. And so while this data does show that the virus can definitely infect and start the replication cycle within the melon fly, that cycle pretty quickly breaks down where we get little to no expression of viral late genes. Next, I looked at the other side of this transcriptomic uh, uh, project, 
main, namely the fly response to the virus. And specifically, I was looking at the response of fly genes um, when the fly was infected with the virus compared to a saline mock infection of the virus. And so here we're looking at the medfly analysis to begin with. Each of these clusters are of medfly genes that were expressed similar, similarly throughout the time course. And what we find are several clusters here in which there's a dramatic difference, particularly at 12 hours post-injection between uh, the virus infected flies and the mock infected flies. For example, with cluster two here, these are all medfly genes that were significantly down-regulated in response to the virus compared to in the control treatment. And then if we look at cluster four, these are all fly genes that were significantly upregulated in response to the virus compared to the control. If we do the same clustering analysis looking at the oriental fruit fly, we see again there are clusters here with these stark differences in fly gene expression in response to the virus. So cluster two here, these are uh, oriental fruit fly genes being upregulated during viral infection. Cluster four is the opposite in this case, also cluster nine down here. So there's these you know, differences that we're seeing. If we do the same analysis within the melon fly, we really don't see much of these dramatic differences between expression of the fly genes in response to the virus. And what this tells us is that rather than the melon fly having some very competent immune system that can clear out the virus, rather what we think is happening is that the melon fly is simply outside of the host range of this virus, and therefore the virus can't perform what it needs to do to successfully replicate, and the fly doesn't even sort of recognize, transcriptionally at least, that it's been infected with something. So D. Longi displays this varying compatibility pattern within these tropical fruit fly species in which both medfly and oriental fruit fly are permissive hosts for the wasp, while the melon fly is a non-permissive host. And then the activity of the viral symbiont, DLEPV, is strongly associated with this host compatibility pattern, where we see rapid virus replication and abundant fly mortality in the two permissive species, whereas we see no virus replication and much reduced mortality in the non-permissive species. Suggesting that DLEPV could be a major contributor to the success of this parasitoid species as a generalist and more broadly as a globally successful biocontrol agent. So the last project I'm gonna share is one that was really fun for me because it allowed me to actually get outside for once. And it looked at the prevalence of this viral symbiont in the wild. Um, looking at these viruses in wild populations has not been um, done very much with all of these other systems, mainly because they're permanent parts of the wasp, so they will always be present. But because we know that this virus is not integrated and some wasps can survive without it, it begs the question if we would find it in wild wasps. And if we find it, you know, how important is this virus to wild wasps compared to the lab? So as I mentioned, this wasp is used for biocontrol in Hawaii, um, and we specifically uh, find it from populations of both the medfly and oriental fruit fly that are established on the islands, and therefore the parasitoid is also established. And I particularly looked at the big island for this study. And so basically what we were looking for is to try to collect wild wasps from a bunch of places and um, screen them to see if they were infected with the virus. And so I started at this place here called OK Farms, which is in Hilo, Hawaii. Among many things grown at OK Farms, they grow coffee. And the coffee cherries at OK Farms are known to be infested with medflies. Um, and so we collected a bunch of coffee, we brought it back to the lab, we set them up in these bins and basically left them alone for a week so that any flies that were infesting the fruits would complete their larval development and then exit the fruit to pupate. And then we could take those fruit fly pupae that we collected and place them into individual wells of these plastic grid structures. And basically what this allows us to do is just observe what ultimately starts coming out of these fly pupae, whether it's an adult fly or whether an adult parasitoid. And so from this method, we could sort of clearly pick out D. longi because it's bright orange and the females have a very long ovipositor. And so that's how we sort of grab them. So once I got my female longi from the field, I immediately dissected out their venom glands because 
I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the venom gland itself is sort of a really nice diagnostic tool. Just looking at whether it has that blue iridescence uh, can tell you pretty much whether it's infected with the viral symbiont. And so what I found was something kind of interesting here, which is that I dissected individuals that looked much like what we expected to see. Uh, these venom glands have these really long stringy tubules that are somewhat blue at certain parts here. But then I also had individuals that I dissected with venom glands looking like this, in which you still have this similar sort of football orange reservoir part, but then these accessory tubules are very much truncated, which was quite puzzling at first until I started barcoding these individuals and found that what we thought was one species of D. longi is actually at least two cryptic species of wasp. Um, and I should mention that this species complex was first described in Thailand populations of D. longi, but to my knowledge, we were unaware that we had them in Hawaii. And so basically what we have here, I'm calling this top group the long venom gland species uh, because they are distinguishable by that venom gland morphology. And so this is the species that we have in colony, and it's the species that we know to have this symbiotic relationship with the virus. And then there's this bottom species group I call short venom gland, um, which was completely new to me and very, very exciting. If we screen these individuals for the viral symbiont with PCR, what we find is that top group, 100% of individuals screen positive for the virus, um, which would make sense. This is the one we expected to find it in, but only 22% screen positive for um, the short venom gland species. And I kind of think this 22% is more so artifacts of contamination just because these different wasp species are all attacking the same flies. But regardless, top species group is stably infected with the symbiont. And since this was the one we were expecting to find the virus, we did find it in every single individual, suggesting that just like in the lab, um, this virus is super critical for these wasps to have in the wild. So this is that same data, but in a different format, showing that we collected coffee, it was infested with medflies. Those medflies were infested with D. longi, but of these two cryptic species types, correspondingly, only about half of individuals, uh, wasp individuals, screen positive for the virus. I next wanted to know whether this pattern of finding the virus was also true for wasps that are using different fly hosts. So I went out to the beach parks in Hawaii many of which have these beautiful tropical almond trees, and these trees drop these tropical almond fruits, um, which are known to be infested with oriental fruit fly. So much the same as what I did with the coffee, I collected a bunch of these tropical almonds and reared out the parasitoids within them. So here's that data set. We collected tropical almonds. They were infested with oriental fruit flies. Um, at this location, we got the longi, but only of the short venom gland species, and therefore, none of the individuals screen positive for the virus. And so this sort of um, nails down this pattern that we're seeing in which this species does not seem to be infected with the virus at all. So fast forward, we uh, performed several other collections of coffee or tropical almonds around the big island. And in each case, that pattern uh, was holding up. So if we have mostly short venom gland, like in this Ka'u coffee collection, we have mostly uninfected individuals. Um, if we have locations where it's all the long venom gland, all of the individuals are positive for the virus. So it's very much only infecting one of these species. And again, of that species, we expected to find the virus. Every single individual we caught um, has it. So D. longi represents at least two cryptic species on the big island. This was surprising, but honestly, I'm very excited about it. And that's supported by DNA barcode differences, phylogenetic analysis, and differences in that venom gland morphology. And then only one of the two species is consistently infected with the viral symbiont. Um, again, suggesting that this virus is critical for these wasps to have in the wild, just like it seemed to be in the lab. Although I will say that that post-hatch transmission strategy I shared with you all today might also be contributing here to the absolute infection frequency that we're seeing, just because the virus seems to be very good at transmitting among wasps. So I'm really excited because I think, one, the fact that we only find this virus in one of several complex or species complex members tells us that it's a super, super young association. 
um, and that it may be correlated with the speciation of this lineage. Um, and that viral acquisition might be correlated with the physical expansion and size that we see with that venom gland, um, which I think is really cool. And so part of the work I have planned as a new PI is to maintain colonies of both species because by using and comparing the two together, the one that has the association and the one that doesn't, we can start to learn more about how these um, relationships, how viruses transition from being beneficial or too beneficial in the first place. Because all of these other parasitoid virus systems we know about are very ancient in origin. Some of them are like a hundred million years old. So it's hard to tell from those exactly how these um, beneficial viruses um, happen in the first place. Okay, so I think these last three projects really highlight how um, the pox virus exhibits novel dynamics compared to other parasitoid viruses, uh, but in some cases align more closely with bacterial symbionts and therefore support the classification of this virus as a true symbiont. And then lastly, lastly I hope if nothing else, my work shows that viruses are important symbiotic players. I think a lot of times they get overlooked in favor of bacteria and other types of microbes, but it's clear that they can play pivotal roles in insect biology and evolution. All right, last but not least, I promised I would sprinkle in um, a bit about the prospects I think these viruses can have for fruit fly biocontrol. So as I've shown you today, these two parasitoid species, which are some of the most dominant and successful biocontrol agents used against tefritid fruit fly pests around the world, they both have these heritable viruses that we really didn't know about until pretty recently. And so these viruses represent previously hidden aspects of natural biological systems that are used to target fruit fly pests. And at least one of these viruses, as I've shown you today, is highly lethal to a number of the world's most devastating fruit fly pest species. And um, so part of my plan is to similarly characterize the virus within Phobius wasps. My guess is that it's similarly manipulating fruit fly physiology, but maybe through different mechanisms. In order to use these viruses in future biocontrol innovations, I really think we need to identify the molecular basis for the effects that they're having on the flies. And one way to do this would be to try to narrow down the specific viral proteins or viral genes that are causing the phenotypes that we see. And so luckily we're well positioned to start this kind of work by combining state-of-the-art tools in functional genomics and manipulative genetics. For example, RNAi I've developed now for both of these parasitoid species. And hopefully we can couple that with things like CRISPR genome editing, which has been developed in several of these tropical fruit fly species. And hopefully using tools like that together, we can start to narrow down um, potential viral effector proteins that are killing the flies. And so, you know, if everything goes right way down the road in the future, after passing a million regulatory hurdles, I think it's possible that we could transition into developing these types of viral derived proteins uh, for fruit fly suppression. And whether that means spraying crops with these viral derived proteins or genetically engineering the plants to produce them. The hope being that when the fruits become infested with flies, they consume the viral proteins and die, leading to population suppression. And I know that's a little hand wavy, um, but I, I do think that there's potential now that we know about these fly targeting viruses to one day either exploit the viruses themselves or specific viral genes for biocontrol strategies. And I think there's additional uses for um, knowing about the molecular traits that really successful biocontrol agents have. Like in this case, um, they both have these heritable viruses. You know, what other molecular traits do biocontrol agents that are very good and effective share? And in this way, I think studying these types of interactions could be translated to completely new pest systems. And then lastly, here I, I put down like another, another use of understanding these virus fly interactions could be to identify the physiological pathways within the fly that the virus is targeting or the, the fruit fly weak spots that could then be followed up um, with designing pesticides to target. Anyway, so I'm very excited about this line of work. Something is very much long-term for me, but I think could be really um, exciting. So I'd like to thank those at the USDA on the big island for help with